Welcome back. Canada had never seen anyone quite like our first guest when she married the Prime Minister at the age of 22. She captivated the entire country and eventually became the mother of another Prime Minister. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> She is a best-selling author and devoted mental health advocate. In her one-woman show called Certain Woman of an Age, she leaves no stone unturned as she injects humor into the wild, tragic, and beautiful moments that shaped her one-of-a-kind life. Please welcome back to the show, Margaret Trudeau. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Thank you. Great to be here. <laughs> So, uh, if we can, Mr. Trudeau, if we can dive Margaret. straight at Margaret, yeah, if we can dive straight into your show. One of the central parts of the show is uh, your experiences with bipolar disorder. And you say that being the Prime Minister's wife prepared you for being in a psychiatric ward. <clears throat> Maybe the only thing that could. <laughs> uh, your words here. So, how much humor and how much truth is there in that statement? Truth, <laughs> truth. <laughs> um, I used to call 24 Sussex the crown jewel of the federal penitentiary system. <laughs> Because it really was a very cold institution. Uh, one third of it was our living quarters, two thirds of it was working in staff. I had seven live in staff, and I was so young and I had all these people. I found it very hard to mm -hmm. live there. So, why I, how, how it's similar is because I also have been in, in a psychiatric hospital. Uh, so, uh, you know, the first one is that everybody uh, is very kind and friendly and constantly checking in on you. <laughs> And all the time, you know they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and there's four more four ending up with surveillance all the time. Mm -hmm. So it, it, I say it, I sort of felt like I was in a padded lock cell at, at 24, but then I got to be in a real one. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay, so you also talk about some lighter moments, like the, your days, your wild days, my wild dancing days. at Studio 54. So you have this photo here. Your In time, and tell us what it was like in these moments to be dancing at such so an iconic I, place. I get a call. I was studying acting in New York. I had a very good studio, and I'd have to go out each each day and find my acting partner in Brooklyn and Queens in a tenement somewhere. I'd go in the subway, and I get a call in the morning. It was to be Stevie Rubel, who owned Studio 55. Maggie, you got to come down to the studio tonight. All the stars are going to be there. Send up a car. <laughs> <laughs> I have a car, big, huge car arrived. <laughs> and take me down to the studio. And the studio was the freest place on the planet because it was pre-AIDS and it was just when people were beginning to emerge, certainly in New York, to take on their own identities, to, to be themselves but, or to be absolutely wildly risque. There was always the bride who was this beautiful big black man with his veil and, but he forgot to put on his dress, <laughs> just the corset <laughs> and the stockings. But it, there was everything there. But what also was at the studio, which was interesting, was that everyone, we'd finish up our big galas, our big evenings, whatever, and 11 o'clock, we'd all say, see you at the studio. So we'd get the governors and the mayors and the politicians and, and all, everybody would go down there because it was very elegant, but it was also, so free. And we, did we dance? Did we dance? Wow. <laughs> and one night, Liza Minnelli's birthday party, at least a thousand pounds of feathers came down from the ceiling. And we're all dancing in all these wild feathers. I mean, oh. it, was, it was imagination and fun and wild and no rules. And then it was over like everything. And a big slap in the face to all that freedom mm. with the uh, onset of AIDS. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, to prepare for this show, you're revisiting all kinds of memories, and to do that, you went through some of your personal belongings, and these were things that you hadn't gone through since the passing of My your poor son. psychiatrist, every time I went in to see him, I'd say, I still can't look at the boxes. He'd say, one day you will be able to look. I felt like a prisoner in my own home. I yeah. couldn't move, I couldn't go anywhere, because I had all these boxes in the basement, which I could not open, because then I might see his happy face. So I just wouldn't. And then I had, was doing this show, and we, we have screens behind, so it's all the pictures of my life. Yeah. So I had to go into the boxes. 
oh, I wept. Mm -hmm. oh, I love. No, it was okay because I healed. I, I had to get my whole life into pictures. And one of the things that happens when you're mentally ill, and the time, and I was mentally ill for a, a, a chunk of my life, is that you're wrong thinking, and you don't think of yourself in the way others think of you. Or and so I'm seeing, oh, who was this girl, and what a life she had. As I look, oh, what a happy mummy. As I look through all the pictures, but it does, it does hurt uh, when you know there's no more pictures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never going to be another one. Oh. As a parent, it's, it's got to be difficult to see your child critiqued. Your son, Justin Trudeau, is subjected to so much is criticism. He? Just a little bit. <laughs> I would say nationally and internationally, especially now that we're in the midst of an election campaign. What is, what is that like for you as a mom? Do you know mom? what? I had to learn a long time ago, and I'm glad you're not the Toronto star and that you're live TV, <laughs> because I do not read the press. Why would I? Why would I read those awful things they say? Why would I listen to those attack ads? They are not my son. This is the political game, and it's mean. <laughs> I don't. I, I. I like to think I'm beyond politics. That I don't have to think in that way. That I can go on to another level of worrying about how how healthy Justin is, how much sleep he's having, whether he's getting his exercise, whether his mood is good. All the things that we as mothers care about our children. And quite frankly, he's he's a man. I. I I, as we all mothers do, we just have to sort of step back and say, your turn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, <laughs> true. Your turn. At one point in your show, you encouraged the women in the crowd to oh, join dear. you in a chant of F you. I do. In defiance of those who have I held do. them back in their lives. So well, why, like, talk about <laughs> this cathartic <it's>, moment <laughs> and what it's like. It's really, I, I talk about how uh, my first F you's were so unsure, kind of kind of a whisper, Tentative. and then kind of a question. Thank you. But oh, I'm sorry, I just said it loud. I fuddled out a little. But I, I, it's just, it's not what it seems to be. It's not, I'm not talking in obscenity. What I'm doing is, is, is talking about our rage as women being told that we can't do it mm -hmm. and it's never been done and get in your place. And it's just our sort of feminist rage. I have five questions that I hand out in the play that I've written that the audience asks me and one of them is, are you a feminist? And so this is about having, getting over your rage, taking your place, believing in yourself, being confident. So at one point I get the whole audience just to shout it out. Many <laughs> <laughs> like it. <laughs> well, Margaret, what we're seeing here is you have amazing stories. So we're gonna play a little game with you, a okay. little game of rapid fire, okay. if you will. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we, we know you have mingled with some of the most iconic people of our time. So you will give you a name. You give us like uh, like a word, maybe okay. a sentence okay. about that person. Short and okay. sweet. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Shall okay. we do it? I'll start. Mick Jagger. Arrogant oh. ass. Oh! That was quick. That was really <laughs> quick. That, that was quick. Play. Um, <laughs> no thinking about that one. Wow. It really was. Andy Warhol. Oh, my darling. Oh, gee. Uh, Andy had such a vision, and he didn't talk much, but he said gee a lot of times. And I'd stand next to him at Studio 54, and he'd he had a little camera around it, and he'd say, oh, gee, look. And he'd point out the most amazing things to look at, because he was such an artist. Wow. I loved Andy. He and I were How about this name, Jack Nicholson. Oh, what a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Except, babe, okay. it's time to leave. These weeks have been fun. But Angelica's coming to town, oh! so don't you get, babe? <laughs> no, no, he, Jack is the freest rogue that you could have on the planet, but he makes no bones about it. He never has. He, you're just, he's a very intelligent man, too. He was, I don't have any idea what Jack's like now. Mm. Do you think he's old? I think so. <laughs> I think so. Okay, last know. one for you, <laughs> Fidel Castro. Ah. His, shoulder, his hand on my shoulder, he was one of Pierre's pallbearers. And I wasn't having a very good time. I was falling. And his hand on my shoulder to not make me go to Justin to say, Margaret is a man. I just, yeah, he had to ride. I couldn't go to him, but he, he, Fidel was a good friend. He was a kind man, not a, I can't say friend. We saw, you know, only official visits in Cuba, except he did come up to Pierre's, uh, Pierre's funeral. Fidel uh, uh, changed the trajectory of many, 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 many Cubans into having health and education. So yay, the two things that we take for granted. Fascinating life.
Margaret, this has been an absolute pleasure to have you back. Uh, great you. to see you and good Thank luck with you. the show. Thank you. Thank you. So you can catch, you can catch Certain Woman of an Age at JFL42. So just visit thesocial.ca for ticket information. We'll be right back after this.